Hi, and welcome to Wrongful, a podcast where we look at cases of potential wrongful convictions. Follow along as we introduce you to our first case, the trial of Zachariah Anderson. Hi, and welcome to Wrongful, Episode 4, Building a Case. In our last episode, we discussed a police investigation in the case of Rosalio Gutierrez's disappearance. What we found was that their search solely consisted of looking for evidence related to Zachariah Anderson, the ex-boyfriend of one of the missing man's romantic interests. While the bloody scene in Rosalio's apartment leads one to believe he was a victim of some form of violence, there was no direct evidence showing that he had definitely been murdered there. There was also no evidence placing Zach at the scene, and there was no evidence tying anything at Zach's home back to Rosalio. What the police had was a series of circumstantial evidence that they would try to use to make Zach look guilty. In fact, they didn't have enough evidence to even charge him for the presumptive murder. Zach was being held on stalking charges, but he was aware that they were looking for evidence to tie him to the alleged murder, as his name had already been thrown out into the media. They placed no contact orders, preventing him from having any contact with his two brothers, his girlfriend Christine, Sadie, his daughter, and also with Celia and Nereida. Zach was alone and his bail was high. He knew as soon as he fronted the bail money, they would look for another charge to hold him on while they tried to build the murder charges. So, he waited. Eventually, seven months later, they would find something they could use. They would find one area of trace DNA that they believed belonged to Rosalio Gutierrez. This finding would lead to a homicide charge being filed against Zach in December of 2020, along with the charge of hiding the corpse. In this episode, we'll explore this DNA and the building of the case by the DA's office. When Zach's van was seized by police back in May of 2020, it was taken to a location for testing to be conducted. One of the specialists, Julianne Avila, would be responsible for doing this testing. Zach's van was described to be very cluttered and messy. What was your overall impression of the state of the vehicle? The vehicle was um, <clears throat> had a significant amount of wear and tear to it. As I said, the carpet was missing, the carpet was dirty, there was a lot of clutter in it. And was it very dirty in the inside? It was. Not only was there dust and debris throughout the interior, as one would expect with a work van, but there were also reddish-brown spots in several places. We discussed earlier about the chainsaw Zach transported in his van when he was working on his family's tree farm. This chainsaw used a red oil, and it is believed that this explains the stains throughout the van, as the oil could easily rub off against other items. Considering the reddish-brown color of the stains, the crime scene specialist also tested the van for blood. Um, what I did was I used something called phenothaline, which is a presumptive test um, for, for blood. Um, it's, not a, it's not a determining factor. It just is a, it could possibly be. And so I tested the steering wheel. I tested um, the running board along the side of the driver's um, side of the vehicle. There was an area behind the front passenger seat, the seat belt, um, the carpet, and then the seats were all missing out of the van. So I tested a few areas of the carpet. I also tested it if, you know, like sometimes in the back of those vans, they have like cup holders where the seats would be. There were some reddish stains there that I tested. I tested areas on the metal parts, which is the, the bottom part that had no carpet. I tested along there um, with phenothaline, and they were all negative. And when you say they were all negative, what does that mean? There was no indication of blood um, using phenothaline as a presumptive test. The van would test completely negative. There was also a piece of carpet that he had cut out of the very back of the van. We discussed before how he had cut this piece out after gasoline, also from his chainsaw, had spilled and soaked the carpet. The missing carpet was a big argument by those that believe Zach's guilt. They believe he had to have cut the carpet out to hide evidence of a bloody body. But even if the carpet had been soaked with blood and cut out, 
underneath and to the bottom and the grooves of the van, there was no blood found during testing. Not only that, the interior of his vehicle does not suggest a cleanup at all. The van was filthy. It was full of dust and debris like you would expect out of a work van. And how would you have thoroughly cleaned the van without getting rid of the dirt? And why would Zach just cut out the small square section of carpet? If there was a bleeding body in the back, it would have been much safer to remove the carpet in the back and not just a small piece of it. For starters, Rosalio was a large man and his body would not have been contained in that small section, estimated to only be approximately 3 feet by 3 feet. If Zach had been worried about any DNA or evidence in the carpet, wouldn't it make sense to remove any carpet that came into contact or was in proximity? His brother Solomon speaks about the lack of blood in the following clip. When he hypothetically puts the man down in the back of the van, why isn't there any other splash? Why isn't there blood draining onto the bumper, blood draining onto the carpet when the blood saturates the carpet? Because this is what they allege is that, is that the carpet is removed because DNA evidence saturated the, the carpeting. If that's the case, then why isn't there any blood on any of the hardware or in any of the crevices on any of the hardware in the back of the van? Because there's none. When they test for luminol, they find no blood in any of the bolts, the rivets, any of the brackets, nothing. The van is dark, no blood evidence, nothing in there. But that's not all. Let's listen again to the testimony of Susan Brown Williamson, Zach's employer. Mr. Anderson was doing um, demo on your house and you had mentioned something about him um, taking the debris back to his house? Yes. And do you know how he would do that? He would use my trailer, an aluminum utility trailer, and he would use um, an old minivan that he had. Um, he took all the, the seats and carpet and stuff out of it and was just using it like in lieu of a pickup truck, but he had a minivan, so he put all the stuff in there. Did you say that he took the carpet out? It was an old vehicle that was gutted, and then he used it to haul stuff from my, you know, that the dirty lath and plaster and and all of the stuff that he was finding in the walls. And did, to your knowledge, would he use trash bags to put the demo, the lath, the plaster in? Yeah, he used um, big black trash bags and some trash cans from my property, and probably some of his own trash cans. And then he would put it in the back of his van and then transport it back to his house because he had a dumpster there? Yes. We have witness testimony that this carpet was removed prior to May 17th, before Rosalio went missing. Nothing of evidentiary value would be found in the van, that is, until a small speck described as a pinprick of a reddish-brown substance was found on the back side wall of the van. The coloring matched the same reddish-brown color as the other stains in the vehicle that tested negative for blood. But due to its size, they could only do one test before the sample would be destroyed and they would be unable to test further. They either had to test for blood or test for DNA. They opted to test for DNA. Lisa Treffinger, who is a Wisconsin State Crime Lab forensic scientist, testified on the stand that the DNA came back as a single-source male. Who's... DNA, uh, was that a match for, if any, uh, who, what, what person was it a match for? Uh, Rosalio Gutierrez. But what does this mean? If you have a basic understanding of DNA, you will know that it's not an exact science. Basically, everyone's DNA profile is made up of peaks. When determining if someone's DNA is a match, you are comparing these peaks. But with trace DNA, this can be very difficult as you can find false positives due to the size of the sample and the size of the DNA peaks. This is why typically you'll receive a probability percentage or weight, giving you the likelihood that it is a match. Lisa does not provide this weighted probability in saying it's a match for Rosalio. Without her specifying this data, it leads people to believe that it was a definite 100% probability match when the data was not provided. And the fact that this is a trace DNA makes it even harder to be certain. We are now seeing the ramification of faulty DNA testing being used in criminal cases. The following clip details a case where a man was falsely accused of a crime due to DNA. Forensic scientists has helped law enforcement solve many crimes which otherwise would have remained a mystery, but as technology advances for collecting DNA samples at crime scene, so does the possibility of error. 
Experts in the field say that your DNA can be collected from a crime, a crime scene you've never even been at. And in the case of Lucas Anderson, it led to murder charges. Joining me to talk about this is RT correspondent Brigida Santos. Brigida, let's talk about the case of Lucas Anderson. How did his own DNA frame him for murder? In 2012, a homeless alcoholic man named Lucas Anderson was charged with first degree murder when his DNA was found on the body of a murder victim who had been killed in a home invasion. Now, his DNA was specifically on the murder victim's uh, fingernails. And the way that they got there was through a process called secondary transfer. All that means is that as humans, we leave our cells everywhere we go. In fact, we shed about 50 million skin cells per day. And those cells, our DNA, can then get picked up and moved around by a third party. So that's all that means. It turns out that on the night of this murder, Lucas Anderson had been passed out drunk in a hospital. Now, he could not remember where he was that night, so police, when they asked him about his whereabouts, he said he had no recollection. He also had a previous history uh, and one conviction for a home invasion, and that's how this man was murdered. So it did not look good for him, but his lawyer did uh, retrace his steps, and she was able to find out that he was actually innocent of this crime and that he had never met the murder victim or even ever been to the crime scene. Lisa Treffinger testified that even though it wasn't tested and confirmed to be blood, it was her opinion that it was. Her opinion is based on the color and not scientific data. But the color of this speck was the same color as all of the other stains that tested negative for blood from the van. This testimony led people to believe that without a doubt that blood was found in Zach's van, even though she labeled it as an opinion. She was asked in cross-examination from the defense if it was a possibility that it was skin cells, which she agreed. I did not confirm the swab for blood. So it's possible that it could be blood, also possible it could be from um, not the stain, but the DNA could be from skin cells. That would be a possibility. This opens up the idea that even if this was definitely Rosalio's DNA, we now have the possibility that it was skin cells. If it was DNA from skin cells, it's very likely it could be from transfer DNA, similar to the case we just heard in the previous clip. To understand transfer DNA, let's think of it this way. Say you hug your children goodbye before they go to school. Your DNA is now on their clothing. Say your child goes to school and hugs one of their friends. It's quite possible that your DNA has now made it to your child's friend's clothing. This concept is really endless and frankly quite terrifying to think about, especially now that we are seeing DNA come into play more in criminal cases. In this situation, Sadie could have had contact with Rosalio and could have had traces of his DNA on her or her items. She also shared kids with Zach, so DNA could have been transferred through his kids to a vehicle they rode in. Not only that, but we know from cell phone evidence that Rosalio had navigated to Zach's house near the end of April through his Waze app. It is possible that he actually went there that night to mess with Zach's vehicle, similar to what Zach allegedly did to his. Remember back when Michael Campbell and Brandon Hendrickson went over to confront Zach and broke the police perimeter? Michael Campbell had already been at Rosalio's apartment that same day. How do we know he didn't accidentally or intentionally transfer Rosalio's DNA into Zach's van by rummaging through it? Campbell says he never got near Zach's vehicle, but we can't verify that. If he had, would he really admit to it? These were two guys who felt confident enough to trespass in front of the police and confront a man they believe just brutally murdered their extra-large friend in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Would it really be a stretch to think that perhaps they had also chosen to snoop around a bit further for their friend? We don't know and can't prove how the DNA got into Zach's van. But what we've just seen is several instances of reasonable doubt to how it was transferred there that still precludes Zach from being involved in Rosalio's disappearance or murder. And remember, we still don't even know beyond a reasonable doubt if that DNA was definitely Rosalio's, because the data was never testified to. In this case, I believe the DNA was used in a misleading way, because the average person does not understand it at the level of an expert, so we tend to believe whatever the expert says, even if in this case it was just an opinion. Lisa Treffinger's testimony was harshly criticized by another forensic expert, Tiffany Roy, in a complaint she filed with the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. The following was included in her report. After reviewing her videotaped testimony, I had several serious quality concerns which I determined needed to be reviewed by the laboratory quality team. This complaint is about the testimony of Lisa Treffinger offered in the case of Wisconsin v. Zachary Anderson. Ms. Treffinger made several misstatements and overstatements of the tests she performed 
and the data she reported in the Anderson case. She makes statements when prompted that use the phrase reasonable degree of scientific certainty, which has no meaning in science and the use of which has been recommended against. It may very well be a legal standard, but not a scientific standard, and Treffinger is not a lawyer at liberty to comment on legal standards. For all the pieces of hair evidence tested, she stated that they matched Rosalio Gutierrez without providing a statistic or likelihood ratio to give weight to the comparison. This makes the jury believe the hairs, toothbrush, and other items of evidence where source is attributed are undoubtedly belonging to a specific person because they are unaware of any statistics that state otherwise. Treffinger also answers in an affirmative about events that could have caused someone's DNA to be on an item. While it may be appropriate to educate the jury on research regarding transfer, persistence, prevalence, and recovery of DNA, those descriptions should not be case-specific circumstances or evidence. Treffinger confirms she believes that the cells which are responsible for the DNA are skin cells or blood, but does not provide the basis for her opinion. In fact, no serological data or result can inform a DNA analyst of these things. Her casework training and experience would not be sufficient to inform on such an opinion as the one offered here. She makes statements for several items that Rosalio Gutierrez is the source of the blood on those items. She is connecting dots and making associations that are the province of the trier of fact. Lisa Treffinger performed a comparison of DNA profiles from several items of evidence to the DNA profile of Rosalio Gutierrez, but opining on the source of the DNA profile as blood and opining that the source of the blood was Rosalio Gutierrez was completely improper. I would ask the lab to review what actually is reported in her report to see how the statements made in testimony differ. The reason these statements aren't included in the report is because it's an opinion that goes a step too far and exceeds the information modern testing can provide. The inclusion of source attribution statements in her report is problematic enough, but this coupled with the attribution of the blood to Rosalio Gutierrez is egregious. The reason this opinion was not included in her report not reviewed by her peers, and not consistent with the quality standards of the FBI, is because these are not scientifically supported statements. We see from her report that this DNA was misrepresented, and it definitely played a part in Zach's conviction. Without this DNA, the case would not have even been prosecuted, so this is a vital part of the story. We can see early on how this information also affected how the media reported on the case. The local media would be reporting on the case with all articles linking to Zach as a primary suspect. Before the trial would even occur and people could weigh the actual facts, people were coming away believing that Zach was definitely guilty. Local titles included Homicide Case Built of Putting Pieces of a Puzzle Together with Circumstantial Evidence. Zach's attorneys were worried that he wouldn't be able to receive a fair trial due to the amount of media reports on his case in the area. If people are hearing in the news 24-7 that there was a murder and Zachariah Anderson is the person believed to have done it, it creates an assumption of guilt in people's minds before they've weighed the evidence. There was also some difficulty in finding a judge that did not have connections to Rosalio due to his work in the public defender's office. Despite these issues, Zach's motion to move the trial to a new location would be denied. Finally, Judge Bruce Schroeder would be selected. If this name sounds familiar, that's because he was the judge who presided over the notorious Kyle Rittenhouse trial. In December of 2021, Zach had been held in jail for a year and a half without a scheduled trial, so his lawyers filed for a motion to demand for a speedy trial, which is a protected right, part of the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution. Finally, the trial was scheduled to take place March 14, 2022. Life in jail was hard for Zach. He was unable to talk to his brothers, his girlfriend, or his kids. He was isolated and the conditions in jail were rough. We've even heard inmates say that jail is worse than prison. This is just baffling. Prison is where people go when they have a guilty verdict. However, jails hold many people who have not received judgment and are supposed to be viewed as innocent until proven guilty. 
So why is it that people who are presumed innocent are held in worse standards than those with a guilty verdict? Not only that, but time being stolen away from their lives while they wait to hopefully be exonerated and let go. Even if the verdict for Zach had been not guilty, he had already lost three years of income, time with his family, including young children whose development in three years is quite a leap. In three years' time, there can also be severe, irreversible damage to one's physical and mental health due to the conditions of their imprisonment. Here is a section from Zach's journal describing what jail was like for him. The extremely harmful neglect and abuse while I spent three years in jail was way beyond most people's imagination. I went from about 215 pounds down to about 167. No real medical care. They regularly made up bogus reasons to throw me in the hole, just to trash my things, and on multiple occasions took my legal material. I presumed to look for information about the case. I had been sent back to Kenosha County Jail and one of the guards, who was not inclined to the harassing and sleep deprivation strategies, told me while walking across the bridge that connects two of the buildings that I was brought back to KCJ downtown for them to break me. Before body cameras, there were two guards that bragged about how it was their job specifically that I was sent back to the downtown facility for them to break me. They didn't let me get a haircut for 11 and a half months at least before I stopped asking. The sun-kissed hut that disappeared from my flesh was because I was not allowed time in the sun. I would have sort of likened it to a three-year interrogation of harassment and hostility that, if not directly performed by the guards themselves, were orchestrated by housing me with the worst offenders and the worst housing units at all times. I wasn't otherwise thrown into a hole. Even for a time in an administrative segregation, they kept me in the cell immediately to any inmate who was off his medication and yelling and pounding all the time. Jail guards that get away with molesting and sexually assaulting inmates to demonstrate dominance, putting inmates known to be violent with other inmates who they were recently in physical altercations with to try to cause another fight where an injury occurs that requires medical attention which forces the institution to press charges. Yes. We didn't press charges. Like Pokemon being tossed into an arena and then the guards would watch the surveillance video for entertainment and joke and laugh. The financial burden to hire attorneys and pay for legal proceedings is difficult for inmates as well. While public defenders can be appointed and they do come without any costs, the amount of time for one to be appointed can be long, increasing their time of incarceration and suffering. Defense attorneys for hire tend to be a preferable option, but they are not cheap. Even affording just the retainer can be impossible for the average citizen. One can quickly become financially bankrupt trying to put up an adequate defense, especially against the seemingly unlimited budget and resources that the state has to convict you. They spent thousands of man hours. They had 15 police agencies that investigated my brother, and they came back with this fluff of a non-existent case. While we've seen cases where celebrities, famously Johnny Depp and O.J. Simpson, where wealthy individuals can easily afford the best attorneys in the field and hire experts to vouch for them, what hope is there for the common person? It's very much a David versus Goliath situation. And the fact is, even if you can come out of your trial winning, you've still lost so much and some you can never truly recover. This financial burden is not limited to just the inmate. The families and friends of the inmate also incur a cost to communicate with their loved one. The prison and jail charge money for phone calls, messaging, and even just sending a letter. Supplies typically need to be ordered from a select company whose whole business is profiting off the incarcerated individuals. While Zach was in custody, Sadie would continue to pursue her custody case. With Zach being in jail, he was limited in his ability to fight back. Here's a piece of his journal discussing that. When I was arrested, I had a few thousand dollars in child care receipts and no child support obligations enforced by the state. I eagerly paid child care, medical, dental, and food cost for my children. Perhaps about eight months into my incarceration, I was in court facing allegations of being a deadbeat, non-contributing father to my three kids. Even though I disputed the allegations, the guardian ad litem appointed by the court to supposedly represent my kid's interest in the proceedings never spoke with me and the court assigned full custody to my kid's mother and established a child support obligation and arrears based solely on the claims by my children's mother. Without any income, support obligations accrued while I remained in custody for more than two years without any income. And while Zach was still responsible for child support, he was still allowed no contact with his children and was no longer allowed to have any part in their life. In the next episode, we'll discuss how seeing his daughter on the stand for the first time in three years had an impact on both of them. While Zach was waiting in jail for his trial, the district attorney's office was still working on building their case against him. 
Officer Van Wee, who was the officer who was on scene, would eventually file the blood pattern analysis report. However, he did not undergo any training until August of 2021 for this. If you noticed anything interesting about that, well, so did we. You will notice that that is 15 months after he processed the crime scene. Following this 40-hour course, he didn't actually write the report until February of 2022, right before the trial was to take place. How did it make sense for someone to undergo training to decipher something after the event had already taken place? And by that point, they had already determined their theory and decided Zach was their guy. So how objective was this report really going to be? It's also worth noting that Van Wee has not testified about any other bloodstain pattern since. It just doesn't make sense at all. It sounds like a formality that was done to try to build a better case against Zach, similar to the other things the DA's office did during this case building time. In this first trial, the defense provided an actual bloodstain expert's report to counter the one prepared by Van Wee. However, her report would not be allowed in due to an objection by the prosecution. We have a situation now where an actual expert is being excluded while an after-the-fact 40-hour course witness is allowed. Judge Schroeder called the actual expert's report snooty before he decided the defense would not be allowed to have her as a witness. So here's an example where the judge is picking and choosing what experts will hear testimony on, all based on how he perceived her tone to be. The first trial began on March 14th of 2022 as planned. However, an issue arose during the prosecutor's opening statement when he mentioned information that had not been disclosed to the defense. We'll give some context to the incident that caused concern. If you remember, Nareda was the girl Rosalio had a date with on the night of his disappearance. She claimed she showed up late, waited in the parking lot for over 30 minutes before leaving. So, she was at the crime scene exactly when the DA's office believes the crime took place. In fact, she is the only one they can definitely place at the crime scene at the time of the alleged murder. She was never investigated as a person of interest, and I wonder if this is because she made sure to use her work email to send the detectives the screenshots of her text with Rosalio. In her email, she uses her signature of being a subpoena clerk and clerical assistant for the Milwaukee District Attorney's Office, which is odd because she took off of work that day to go down to Kenosha to provide her statement. So why did she use her work email, especially if she had taken the day off? She wasn't sending this information in any sort of official capacity. She was just a potential involved party. Does this mean they looked the other way because she was connected to the court system? Nearly two years after her initial statement to police, and shortly before the trial was to take place, the district attorney brought her back in for another statement, and then asked Dorada to meet them at Rosalio's apartment to see where she had parked that night. They provided her the address she was to meet them at. We have no evidence even to what address they gave her. The only people present during that exchange with her were the district attorney and the assistant district attorney. It is unclear why they would suddenly, two years later, feel like they needed to confirm where she parked when she had previously stated she was outside his building. Here is Nareda testifying about that meeting. How, how did you know to go to that location? How do I know to get to that location? Because the DA gave me the address and said, I will meet you to that location so you can explain more detail where, where, you, where exactly where you parked. I said, okay. So did you call the district attorney or did the district attorney call you? They called me. And do you remember um, the district attorney telling you that there's something off with the timeline? Just the, the map. She states following the DA giving her the address, she navigated there using Google Maps for this meeting. But when she didn't show up at the correct apartment, DA gravely discovered she was at the wrong apartment building. Nareda and the DA both argue that Google Maps has an error where it directs people to the wrong building, even when the correct apartment building is put in. The DA became aware of this because of what Rosalio had told Sadie when she went to his house in February of 2020. Rosalio had told Sadie that Google Maps is often incorrect and leads people to the wrong building. However, when Rosalio and Nareda planned to meet up, he never informed her of this issue. So how do we know the error was still occurring in May of 2020, when Nareda was the only one navigating to his house? If it is still a known issue, wouldn't he have mentioned it to her like he mentioned it to Sadie the first time navigating there? It sounds like the DA wanted to use the mentioned issue with Google Maps directing people to the wrong address to prove that Nareda was not outside the correct building that night. The reason this was crucial to their case is because the defense was using Nareda's statement to disprove the timeline in question and again disprove the theory that Zach was there. She stated she had been there from 9.43 p.m. until 10.18 p.m. and had never seen Zach or anything suspicious happening. 
Remember, they theorized Zach Blitz attacked Rosalio from inside the hallway of the apartment. With the way the apartment building was set up, Nareda would have been able to see straight into the hallway where this occurred, and Rosalio's patio was also right next to there, so she would have had a clear vantage point of someone carrying a body out of the patio doors. If Zach was a suspect and hadn't even carried the body out by 10.18 p.m., that means he would not have had enough time to do this and then drive the hour plus home to be there when he is confirmed to have placed a phone call from his home at 11.19 p.m. Nareda's initial statement completely negates any possibility of Zach being the suspect, and the DA was well aware that the defense was going to present that argument. However, if the DA could prove that she wasn't actually outside of Rosalia's apartment, then it opens up the possibility that Zach was capable because there was no eyewitness testimony verifying he wasn't there. But here's the issue I have with Nareda's sudden change in testimony. Even if that Google map issue didn't exist, the evidence showed that Nareda used Apple Maps the night of May 17th to navigate to Rosalia. Leo's house. Apple Maps didn't have the same air that Google Maps did, so there is actually no reason to believe she was outside the wrong apartment building. But the DA Nareda would remain adamant that she was. During Nareda's testimony, I noticed she was very careful not to say she ever thought she was at the correct building. She kept using a circular argument to say that she was at the wrong building the whole time. I would expect that someone with no personal interest would be at least saying, yeah, I assumed I was in the right place at the time because I just followed my GPS, but maybe I was wrong. She hadn't been there in nearly two years and may not have remembered the building number or how she got there. How do we know that the DA even gave her the right address for that meeting? What if he did give her the wrong building number to trick her into thinking she was in the wrong place the whole time? This is just speculation, but that's part of the issue created by DA Gravely making himself a witness in the situation. Ultimately, any other witness could have been asked to supply proof of the address given on that day. Another possibility, if she was involved, which can't be confirmed or denied due to the lack of the investigation, would it make sense for her to go along with this theory proposed by the DA to continue to keep them off her trail? In theory, the actual guilty or involved party might be willing to do whatever it takes to make sure someone else took the fall. And if the DA was proposing a situation in which she could help to ensure that Zach would be convicted, she might have jumped at the chance. Even if she wasn't involved, she may not want anyone suspecting she was, and being at the same place at the same time where a murder occurred could look bad. Alternatively, she may have just been willing to go along with whatever purely for the fact that she worked for a DA's office and wanted to help secure a conviction. Again, this is entirely speculation, but these are the questions we found ourselves asking during the trial. There were no other witnesses to this meeting between her and the DA, and it's not recorded in any way, so who really knows what happened? We had a local resident research for us the visibility of the apartment numbers. They went at night, around the same time Nareda would have been there, and found that the apartment building numbers are clearly visible. If Nareda had been sitting there for 30 minutes waiting to hear from Rosalio, wouldn't it make sense that she would check to see if she was in fact parked at the correct building? She testified to moving her car four times while she waited, which seems like very odd behavior. If we once again return to the thought that criminals do use dating apps as a way to set up for robberies, it might actually make sense as to why she moved her car frequently. What if she was a getaway driver and wanted to make sure no one in the area would be able to identify her car? If she moved it frequently to spots far enough away from each other, the same person would not likely take note of a very brief sighting of a car because how often cars come and go through apartment complexes? But if she sat in the same spot, immediately outside the front door, with the car running for 30 plus minutes, a resident would be more likely to make some sort of mental note about it and be able to positively identify her and the vehicle. This is still speculation, but speculation is part of the process of weighing the evidence, and that's why we want to present these alternate theories. We also know that she withheld from the police the text detailing what time she was supposed to arrive there. Whether Nareda had any nefarious involvement that night is impossible to say at this time without more information, but it's still a major sticking point for me as far as what the police should have been investigating. I have never heard of any other murder investigation where they don't investigate the person that was confirmed to be at the scene of the crime at the time the crime occurred. Instead, they investigate a man whose phone records placed him at his home in Mequon over an hour away from where the crime occurred. They took Nareda's word for it that she was never inside his apartment and then encouraged her to change her statement that she was never even there at all. Yet, despite having evidence that Zach was never anywhere near the crime scene, they accuse Zach of lying about his whereabouts and explain away his phone placing him at home by arguing that he must have left it behind to go drive to and from an unfamiliar area in the dark to go brutally kill a man he had never met or spoken with and dispose of his body along the way. It's just baffling. Now back to the first trial where this whole incident comes into play. 
after the defense found out in opening statements about the DA meeting with Nareda and her changing her statement, it would cause a mistrial to occur, despite how long Zach had already waited. Because the prosecutors were the only ones present during Nareda's change in testimony, it automatically made them witnesses in the very case they were prosecuting, and District Attorney Michael Gravely was added to the defense witness list. His testimony would be necessary to connect the dots of exactly what occurred at the meeting when Nareda suddenly realized she was in front of the wrong building. Not only was this a huge issue because of the DA making himself a witness, but the defense would not even be informed of these details until the trial occurred and did not have time to investigate these claims. Judge Schroeder declared the mistrial and the new trial date was set for September of 2022. More waiting. Following the mistrial, the defense attorneys filed a motion to disqualify the prosecutor, DA Michael Gravely. They argued that in the very rules of professional lawyer conduct as outlined by the American Bar Association, it was not ethical for him to prosecute a case in which he was a witness. The reason this rule exists is because the prosecutor's role in the case gives the illusion that there is more weight or truth, or generally more credibility to the things he or she will testify to. It also gives the illusion that there is more credibility to the case overall because the prosecutor himself witnessed something. Rule 3.7 states, a lawyer shall not act as an advocate at a trial in which a lawyer is likely to be a necessary witness unless 1. The testimony relates to an uncontested issue. 2. The testimony relates to the nature and value of legal services rendered in the case. Or 3. Disqualification of the lawyer would work substantial hardship on the client. They also cited several other instances of prosecutorial misconduct, including a few other Brady violations, where he purposely held onto exculpatory evidence until the last minute so the defense wouldn't have adequate time to investigate or respond. The motion to recuse the prosecutor would be denied. Furthermore, the September trial would end up getting postponed due to Judge Schroeder falling and sustaining a major traumatic brain injury. Some would notice stark differences in the judge's cognitive aptitude following this injury. But if you remember, Schroeder was the only area judge able to try this case and the change of venue had been denied. It was Schroeder or no one. Zach would remain in jail even longer, the new trial being scheduled for February 27, 2023, nearly three years from when he was arrested. During this time waiting for the next trial, the prosecution would continue to try to bolster their case. As we saw last episode, the amount of murder evidence they had was weak, and what they did have was largely circumstantial. The stalking case revolved around the testimony of Sadie and the minor child. Thus, the prosecution needed a witness who could testify that Zach murdered Rosalio. This would involve interviewing several inmates at Kenosha County Jail, looking for someone who had any information that they could use against Zach. One of these inmates was Nicholas McAtee who was offered a deal by the prosecution. Here is McAtee testifying about this. I was uh, offered um, consideration on my federal case or testifying for the prosecution. Eventually, they would find someone who would take the deal. They found Marquan Washington, a cellmate of Zach's who was in jail on serious drug charges and facing a good amount of time based on the amount of crack and marijuana he was slinging. Informing was nothing new to him, as he had done it before. So when he was offered a deal by District Attorney Michael Gravely, he took it. In the following clip, you'll hear him being questioned about that meeting. January, you decide you're going to advance the ball on Mr. Anderson's case to help your federal case. We've established that, right? Uh, yes. Okay. So then on January 17th of 2023, just, I don't know, three weeks ago or so, you sit down with some police officers and the district attorney, right? Correct. Was your lawyer there? Uh, no. He was not there for this interview? No. Okay. But you sat down at the Kenosha County Jail, right? Yes. And, that, and you met with these three individuals for about an hour and a half? I didn't count the time, but I'm talking about right. I spoke with them, yeah. Okay. And... As you were being asked questions, um, who was doing the main questioning? Uh, um, Mr. Gravely? Correct. Okay. Um, was that like exclusively throughout the interview or did the others kind of like chime in once in a while? Everybody spoke up, yes. But it was mainly Mr. Gravely? Uh, yes. Okay. And he made it clear to you that he was very interested in having you come here, right? He wanted to hear what I had to say, yes. And that after you testify, he's going to report back 
to the United States Attorney about how well you did, right? Uh, my lawyers did. You probably would talk to him. But well, yes, he didn't. He didn't really. I didn't ask him that. Okay, but that's what you're hoping for. Yes. Yes. All in service of getting you out of the mandatory minimums and possibly the 262 months that, in theory, in theory you face, right? Whatever it would help with, yes. And you're trying to get down to something where you can get back on the street, right? Uh, yes. Nick testified that Washington had told him about informing. Essentially, he was giving me advice because one of the things that we talked about with our federal cases that we're facing so much time um, and one of the ways he said that if you want to get out of your case, the easy thing to do is to just jump on someone else's case, volunteering his method, I guess you could call it. And he told me what he did, and, you know, he found out information about people's cases and whether it was going through their discovery or just asking them or seeing stuff in the news or newspaper. and and using that to put himself into it by informing detectives that he had information. And did he say what he would do if he didn't know something about the case? He would make something up. He said, as far as he was concerned, it was his life or someone else's, and he said, you know, he would do that to save himself. We see this play out when Washington testified in the trial. In Washington's testimony, he provided generic details about Zach's family and then said that people in jail had nicknames for Zach, one being Superman because of his seemingly superhuman strength, another being Houdini because he could make a body disappear. Zach has denied these nicknames, and one can witness the incredulous facial expression he makes when Washington details a time that Zach allegedly confesses to him. When uh, it appeared to you he was having a nightmare. Yes. And uh, what do you remember about that incident? Uh, I remember I was just, I was laying there the night um, before. I told him about it the next day, but I was laying there and I was reading my book and I heard him um, shout in his sleep before he woke himself up. And, and what did he shout that you heard? He said, die, 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 motherfucker. Uh, and you're quoting as best you remember? Yes. All right. And so, uh, did you ever have a discussion with the defendant about this nightmare that you heard him have, or these words he said? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, and, and so, if you know about how long after that happened, did you bring it up to him? I brought it up to him the next day. Okay, and what did you say to him about it? I pretty much told him, um, you know, I asked him about the situation about that he was locked up about, and I told him that he was talking in his sleep when yelling about some stuff in his sleep and he was like, well, what did I say? And I pretty much told him what he said and he was like, yeah, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, you said it. So I asked him a question. I'm like, did you do it? Like, what, you know what I'm saying? I think you did it. And we went from there. And so what did the defendant respond when you said, I think you did it based on the nightmare? What did he say? Uh, he t I told him to look me in my eyes and tell me that you didn't do it. And he jumped down from the bed and he looked me in my eyes and he said, I did it. He said, that's the reason I have the nightmares. I, I, I'm, I'm unable to sleep at night because I think about it all the time. Was there a discussion at some point where the defendant said to you, is it that obvious? Yes, he did. And so what did the defendant tell you about how he, um, how he committed, uh, uh, the, case, uh, the case that he's charged with and, and what the circumstances were. Uh, he said that uh, he had seen this person and he said he stabbed him and he blacked out. He said he stabbed him, he stabbed him and I just blacked out. And he said he eventually wrapped the body up in garbage bags and got rid of the trash. He threw the trash out okay. and I asked him what did he mean by that? And he said, I said what like dumpster or trash? And he said, once it's gone, it's gone. So knowing that Washington stood to benefit from his testimony against Zach, how believable is this story? Does it make sense that Zach would repeatedly deny his involvement in this allegation, but would so quickly just confess to someone in jail, especially someone with a history of informing? 
We've seen some people argue that it's common for inmates to talk up their charges in jail. But based on Marquand's story of how this unfolded, it wasn't even a situation where Zach was supposedly running around jail bragging to just anyone. He says he was yelling out things in his sleep and then suddenly decided to confess for the very first time ever and since, and we are supposed to find that believable? Washington claims that Zach said he stabbed the victim, which doesn't align with what the officers found at the crime scene. The blood spatter at the crime scene did not indicate a stabbing took place. The police reports indicate the splatter was consistent with blunt force trauma, aka bludgeoning, not a stabbing. Although the DA would go on to propose that Zach had to change weapons during his closing statement, which is odd because they had never theorized anything about a knife or stabbing throughout the whole trial. Was this his way of trying to make sense of Marquand's testimony, even though their own evidence negated it? The DA's theory, for the very first time, was that Zach first bludgeoned Rosalia with a bat or other wooden object, and then must have pulled out a knife and stabbed him because the wooden object broke. So even though they found zero weapons at the scene to confirm any of this, now suddenly Zach became a Swiss army man full of gadgets he could use in a just-in-case scenario. If the bat or wooden object broke, wouldn't Zach have just left it behind? And if he'd bothered to clean it up, how or why would he overlook the couple wood shards that they did end up finding in plain sight on the living room floor? I have to admit, the whole thing just doesn't make sense. And then to add in there, Washington claims that Zach blacked out after the crime. We know already that the timeline was very narrow, if not impossible, but now we add in the time accounting for him blacking out? We know this would have been even more impossible. It also begs the question, why would Zach take the body with him? To go through that much effort and avoid leaving any of your own DNA at the scene, but then to try to remove a large body single-handed with the high risk of being seen, with risk of tying victim evidence to you and your property? It's just insane to me. But bringing Washington's testimony into trial would also open the door into them trying to bring in other acts. This is regarding allegations that Washington made about he and Zach bonding over their drug businesses. The defense argued that this should never have been allowed in. The prosecution was very careful not to allow anything related to Rosalio's past or other acts to come into trial. However, they tried again and again to bring prior past allegation of Zach's one being his South Dakota drug charges. This was something he was dealing with during early 2020. He even came back from one of his court cases that time he stopped at Sadie's to do laundry. He had been caught with drugs in his car and the police alleged he was transferring the drugs to Wisconsin, which he denied. There were also other charges filed against him about having marijuana on the premises when they searched his home, which is a separate charge in a different county. Both these charges were separate cases in different counties and pending litigation. The problem with the prosecution bringing this up in trial is that none of the jurors had been questioned regarding their view on marijuana, which is a pretty polarizing topic. While many states have legalized marijuana and people are more open-minded about it, there are still many who are adamantly opposed to it and believe people who use this substance may be more likely to commit other crimes. This bias could have definitely made some jurors already biased towards Zach, something jury screening would have considered if they knew this was to come into play. The following clip is the back and forth argument between DA Gravely and the defense attorney Birdsall and Judge Schroeder regarding this. This is the, uh, this is the actual answer offered by Marquand Washington when he was asked the question, how did you guys come to bond? He said, we bonded over our discussions of our various uh, uh, activities in the drug trade. Um, and that, that, is, that is the answer he offered as to why he knows those kind of details. So uh, again, Judge, um, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the jury has already heard uh, and been permitted to hear that he was on bond on a matter in uh, South Dakota. Uh, they've already been permitted to hear that there was a grow operation going, that had gone on at his home. Uh, so the, there are facts already in evidence in this case. Uh, this is not uh, information that will be a shock to the jury. Or Judge, um, this is a pretty not very transparent attempt to backdoor some other acts. So there was a limited inquiry earlier over objection. But now what's clear, is not only are you correct this is another act, as we've discussed, clearly barred, but now it's also clear that this isn't some supplemental, to use the state's term, um, this isn't some supplemental offering. This is like turning into the main um, aspect of their case. And he keeps talking about how um, there's all this marijuana at the house. Well, we don't know that. None of it's been tested. And it's a separate case. But I do agree with his observation that uh, people are... Uh, 
feel very differently about marijuana, whether it is or isn't. Uh, it seems that much of the prosecution's case was in tarnishing Zach's character. If they could make him look like a drug lord who was also a stalker, that might make people more apt to believe he would also be a murderer, even if there was no evidence linking him to an alleged murder. We would see the prosecution use the drug charges to bolster their case. It's worth noting that none of Rosalio's background with drug use was deemed relevant. If a person is considered more likely to murder someone because they have a history involving drugs, wouldn't the same theory also apply to someone who goes missing? To many, it seemed like the DA was shopping for a jail snitch. They knew the uphill climb in winning a bodiless homicide and the lack of evidence against Zach. Having someone who could claim a confession was made and also who could throw more past acts regarding drugs could help their case, which was still pretty weak, even with the changing testimonies witnesses were providing. And if there was any doubt that Washington received any favors for his testimony, one can look up his record and find that within months of his involvement in Zach's case, he was released from prison and is now out on probation. Prior to the start of the second trial, the defense also filed what is called a Denny motion. So the Denny motion is pretty unique to the state of Wisconsin. Usually in a criminal trial, one of the strongest defenses is to be able to prove evidence that there is A. Another person that committed the crime or B. There's another person who is more likely to have committed the crime. It's basically the they got the wrong guy defense. Because of a ruling in Wisconsin v. Jenny 1984, the defense now needs to get permission from the judge in order to provide any evidence against another suspect, with the thought that they just can't arbitrarily be pointing the finger at just anyone. So say you were accused of a crime, but you were able to provide evidence that someone else actually did it. You would need to get permission from the judge before you could present it. This is a rather interesting concept because it seems like it really hinders a defendant from being able to adequately defend themselves. The defense did have evidence they wanted to provide against another person. That person was Michael Campbell, the friend and co-worker of Rosalio. In the following interview, Solomon Anderson describes what the Denny motion contained. One, Mr. Campbell was friends and a working associate with Mr. Rosalio Gutierrez. According to several sources, they did contracting work together. Two, According to individuals who know Mr. Campbell, Mr. Campbell owed Mr. Gutierrez a large amount of money, so much so that Mr. Campbell was in fear of losing his house in order to pay Mr. Gutierrez the money that was owed to him. Campbell had interjected himself into police investigations multiple times. Item 6. Tammy Milliger told law enforcement that she heard people talking about Mr. Gutierrez and that these individuals mentioned that they believed the people who did construction work with Mr. Gutierrez had went to the apartment and killed him. Miss Milliger furthered that they mentioned Mr. Gutierrez was rolled up in a carpet and taken to Pheasant Run Landfill in Kenosha County. Number seven, John Hunt, an individual who knows Mr. Campbell, told law enforcement that a few days after Mr. Gutierrez went missing, he saw Mr. Campbell and noticed that Mr. Campbell had cut his hair and was all cleaned up. According to Mr. Hunt, this was unlike Mr. Campbell because Mr. Campbell was always meticulous with his hair and appearance. Mr. Hunt noted that the same day Mr. Campbell had items in his truck, including a rolled carpet. Mr. Campbell said he was taking the stuff to Pheasant Run Landfill. Mr. Hunt had asked Mr. Campbell for the carpet because he would use it on his back patio area. Mr. Hunt also said that it would help Mr. Campbell because it would lighten his load, which in, would in turn cost less for Mr. Campbell to offload. Mr. Hunt said Mr. Campbell was adamant that he could not take the carpet. Mr. Hunt thought this was odd. Uh, item 8. From Mr. Campbell's Cellbrite download, there are messages where multiple people asked Mr. Campbell how he knew details about what had happened to Mr. Gutierrez. Mr. Campbell told those individuals that he had been in contact with Sadie Beecham on May 19, 2020, and that is how he knew about what had happened and how he got information about Mr. Anderson. However, his phone records do not reflect any communication with Ms. Beecham. Further, Ms. Beecham, Ms. Beecham's phone data show, show that she was never in contact with Mr. Campbell. All right, so number nine. There is evidence that someone was in Mr. Gutierrez's apartment on May 18th, 2020, from other evidence that it, it is evident that Mr. Anderson was not in Kenosha on May 18th, 2020. But Mr. Campbell was in Kenosha on this date. Uh, all right, number 10. Although the, the quality is not the best, surveillance video obtained by law enforcement to pick, depicts several trucks driving on 15th Street, where Gutierrez lives, between 8 p.m. on May 17th, 2020 to 2 a.m. on May 18th, 2020 that match the type and color of Mr. Campbell's truck. 
uh, number 11, to date, Mr. Campbell has not provided any information to law enforcement that would preclude his involvement. Judge Schroeder would deny this motion, meaning the defense could not provide any of this information in trial, and the jury would never get to hear any of the evidence possibly implicating Campbell. This decision would seriously hinder the defense's ability to defend Zach. Despite the lack of evidence against him, there was nothing Zach could do to even show that someone else had intent, motive, and opportunity. Because of the Denny motion issue, the defense was never allowed to even allude to there being the possibility that someone else did the crime, and Zach was the only person ever presented to the jury. Which, in my opinion, it is really robbing someone of their ability to defend themselves if you can't even try to present reasonable doubt that they got the wrong guy. Especially since so many people have asked, well, who else could it have been? And made the argument that Zach was the only one that could have done it. The Denny issue would come up again in trial. During defense attorney Nicole Muller's opening statement, there was an objection by the prosecution regarding the mentioning of Sadie and Rebecca's suspicious or cryptic messages and stated that the police ignored Sadie as a possible suspicious character. DA gravely argued that they shouldn't be able to say that because it was the Denny evidence. Realistically, there wasn't enough of an investigation by Kenosha PD on Sadie for the defense to even have the information necessary to present a Denny motion about her. If you remember, in order to present a Denny motion, you must be able to show that the person in question had motive, opportunity, and a connection to the crime. All the police had ever gathered from Sadie was her cell phone data, so the information anyone had on her was minimal. They hadn't even collected her Facebook messages that she admitted to using to communicate with Rosalio and some of his friends during much of this time. Nicole continued to argue that she didn't plan to write a Denny motion in regards to Sadie because she wasn't trying to point the finger at her just saying that the police ignored other suspicious activities and possible leads. Gravely was very heated during this exchange, and he even asked for another mistrial on the grounds that the jury would now associate the name Sadie Beecham with being involved in planning her homicide of Rosalio. Oddly, it also wouldn't be the last time he would suggest a mistrial when he didn't like what the defense was presenting. He asked the judge to once again violate Zach's right to a speedy trial, saying, This is an exception to the speedy trial demand by the defendant. Here is a clip with the back and forth between the defense attorney Nicole and DA Gravely on this issue. This can't be remedied. Sadie Beecham has been accused of murder when Denny exists in, as, as litigation in this, in this state. If I may respond. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. I have not accused anyone of anything. I think it's been very clear that the defense is saying that none of this evidence exists and law enforcement, instead of doing their jobs to investigate, just went with a single individual, that they had tunnel vision. A, a, an extremely proper defense, and this does not fall under Denny, is to say what the law enforcement didn't do. I'm not here to purport that this is what happened, nor have I said that. During trial, it'll be, this message was sent. Hey, detective, were you aware of this? Did you look into it? Do you think it's a little bizarre? Yeah. You can talk about whatever purpose you want. The argument made to the jury is other people should have been looked at. I mean, there, you couldn't be more clear in your argument. The argument was other people did this crime. My client did not, other people did. Here's example one. And she's now laid out specific electronic evidence that she wants the jury to be presented. So not only is she making an accusation, the substance of this accusation is that Sadie Beecham and a friend of hers have conspired to find a third party who will kill this person. That's the allegation that's been just made. And she's indicating that's what the text would lead a reasonable person to believe. There's been no notice of that specific allegation. Naturally, the defense is maintaining that this isn't a Denny issue. As far as notice, if this is concerned that this text message is coming out of nowhere, these are records that were provided by the state. These are records that the detectives in this matter have gone through, went through months ago. They've seen this text message, and if they haven't, that's on them. It's not my fault to make sure they've looked at every piece of paper in the discovery that they provided to me. I found it. I intend to use it to show that law enforcement honed in on my client and didn't investigate anything else. That's not a Denny issue. So as far as notice, the, the states had this information. I'm not using it to point the finger at Sadie. I'm using it to point the finger at the fact that law enforcement did not do an effective job investigating and instead painted my client in a certain way. 
After much deliberation on this, the judge stated that he had no desire to mistry the case yet again and told the defense to file a Denny motion regarding Sadie by 9 p.m. that evening. The jurors were dismissed with instructions to come back not the next day, but the day after, and overnight the defense and state came to an agreement to rectify the situation and moved on. Originally, Sadie's friend Rebecca Jekyll was only on the witness list for the defense, but the state decided to put her on their witness list as well so they could lead the questioning about the suspicious text in question. The parties met for further deliberation on day two without the jury, and the motion for the mistrial was withdrawn by the state. The trial resumed on the third day, on March 1st, and this is when Nicole finally got to complete her opening statement for the defense. So what are your thoughts on this? Should a person be able to use other suspects to provide reasonable doubt? Let's put this into perspective using an anecdote about a sandwich. Say your coworker had accused you of stealing their sandwich from the communal office kitchen. No cameras or eyewitnesses saw you do this, but you don't have an alibi for the time it went missing, and your coworker knows you love turkey sandwiches. You have no way to prove that you didn't eat it, since the same evidence that's missing from proving you stole it is also missing to prove you didn't. But what if you have another coworker who has the discards of a turkey sandwich in their trash? They have evidence now that could tie them to the saga of the missing lunch. Your best defense in this moment is to show this trash can evidence that someone else possibly is a sandwich thief. But if you weren't allowed to bring this up, it would dramatically affect your ability to prove your innocence. We realize the case we are dealing with is much bigger than a stolen sandwich, but we hope this analogy can help put into perspective the problem these Denny motions can pose. As we have seen in this episode, Zach was disadvantaged before his trial even took place. He had been kept awaiting for a trial for nearly three years while the media ran reports insinuating his involvement. He was denied his request to move his trial to a location that was neutral and free from bias. The DA's office continued to seek out witnesses that they could coach into providing testimony to bolster their case against him due to the weak amount of physical evidence. Many of the witnesses the DA would meet with would end up changing their story after speaking with him, as we'll see in our final episode. Then Zach's defense had their legs cut out from underneath them when they were denied being able to present evidence that could point the finger at other suspects. But Zach was already down by most onlookers when Law and Crime would announce a televised trial, all under the title of The Obsessed Ex-Boyfriend Trial. Some comments made about people's first impressions of Zach that we still see to this day relate to his man bun. People really think that anyone sporting that hairstyle must be a stalker or a killer. We mentioned how previously he had chosen to grow his hair out for his daughter to make haircuts easier when they did them together. But Zach had typically kept his hair short following that, but only grew it out because he was denied a barber while in jail. Even showing up to sentencing, his hair was down and a mess because according to his brother Solomon, the guards withheld his hair tie that day. But that's all besides the point. Even if he sported a man bun by choice, that should not play into anyone's consideration of guilt. Those of us who watched the trial live were drawn in by this title. It teased of a love triangle and an obsessed ex who had to eliminate his competition. TikToks went viral immediately. They labeled him as a narcissist whose every move was to control and intimidate his ex and child. Even something as simple as he and his female attorney talking was turned into an attorney-client love affair accusation. Before one stitch of evidence had even been revealed, people had already labeled him guilty. Despite the prosecution carrying the burden to prove guilt, and despite the fact that the accused is supposed to be looked upon as innocent until they are proven guilty beyond all reasonable doubt, most people made up their minds right away. Why do we even need trials when everyone seems to be a body language expert? That's rhetorical, of course. As the trial would go on, we would witness more shenanigans play out, more viral moments, but some people would also start to notice something else. Beyond the courtroom theatrics at play, some started to have their doubts. In our next episode, we'll go through the trial, the shush heard around the world, a DA removed from the room, and the judge doing some, well, odd things. We'll explore these things and more, and then the long-awaited verdict. Bye, everyone, and thanks for listening. If you like what you heard and want to catch our next episode, please make sure to follow Wrongful on all of your favorite podcast platforms, and don't forget to rate us. We would also love it if you would follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X under Wrongful Pod. Keep the fun going in between episodes by joining our Wrongful Podcast group on Facebook to see evidence, discuss episodes, and more.